The mythology of Japan has long been fodder for game makers. Japanese demons, the yokai, combined with the spiritual beliefs of Buddhism and Shintoism, have significantly influenced many of the games that have come out of Japan. Ghostwire Tokyo is no exception. On paper, I was really excited to play this game. As a longtime fan of Japanese horror literature and a fan of Akutagawa, I really wanted to play a Japanese urban horror game. Unfortunately, after playing the game for several hours, I have mixed feelings about Ghostwire Tokyo, which especially relate to the gameplay, tone, and repetitive nature of the open world setting. Perhaps to its detriment, Ghostwire Tokyo's release not long after Horizon Forbidden West and Elden Ring means that the inevitable comparisons will occur. But for Ghostwire Tokyo, this means coming up against two of the best 2022 titles. And while it's not a bad game, if you have $100 to spend right now and had to choose between those three games, you're not going to pick Ghostwire Tokyo. I'm Kat Clay, a writer and a gamer from Melbourne. If you like writing, video games, cosplay and nerd stuff, please hit subscribe. And let's get into Ghostwire Tokyo. So Ghostwire Tokyo immediately launches the player into the story of Akito, who is involved with a car accident as a result of supernatural events in Tokyo. At the point of death, he's possessed with the spirit of a paranormal investigator known only as KK. This possession allows Akito to wield spiritual powers and attack the visitors, who are otherworldly demons that now roam a Tokyo devoid of people. These spirits are being raised by a vengeful man in a creepy mask, along with his gang of creepy mask-wearing sidekicks. The big bad's motivation in this game is as thin as the spirits that litter the city. Although he's eventually given the backstory of a grieving father, this kind of character driven mad by grief has been done many times before. Added to this, our masked villain has kidnapped Akito's sister, Mari, Although I'm yet to see why she was chosen to be a vessel, a sacrifice or what have you. And it's for this reason that Akito is motivated to work with KK in exchange for rescuing Mari. Ghostwire Tokyo's narrative is fairly straightforward and lovers of short video games will enjoy that they can complete this in around 15 to 20 hours, depending on how many side quests you finish. The main quest line is fairly linear track down clues as to Mari's location, and as you do this, uncover the secrets of what the baddies are up to and save the city. While the game didn't grab me at first, it did grow on me through the progression of the story and the expansion of Akito's skills, and part of that relates to the gameplay difficulty, which I'll get into in a second. I've been playing the game primarily through the main narrative, but took some time to complete side quests as well, and ranged from tracking local yokai and dispersing them to finding toilet paper for a spirit trapped in a bathroom stall. I found these a little repetitive and I would have preferred less side quests in exchange for deeper storylines. Added to this, some of the main and side quests involve searching areas for objects or rooms and by gum it can get frustrating very quickly. Although you have your spiritual senses handy, they don't help a lot in tracking down the quest objective. You'll find yourself wandering up and down stairs, going on rooftops, all to figure out where you need to go or to find an object tucked away in the corner. Ghostwire Tokyo is not a difficult game. While I put this on normal to begin with, in order to get through the game quickly for my review, I actually put it up to hard. The game was far too easy. In fact, hard feels like what should be a normal setting. While battles further in the game can be challenging, especially with multiple types of visitors on the field at once, there's never anything particularly unmanageable about combat. One of the issues is that the demons back off after they attack. I compare this to a game like Days Gone, where the sheer hordes of zombies swarm you and they never relent, and you need a real strategy to defeat these hordes. That was so enjoyable in a challenging way. But here they don't press hard enough. Attacks are easy enough to dodge or block, and a simple strategy of walking backwards as you pick off enemies one by one suffices. Added to this, many of the enemies can be downed in one swift move if you sneak up on them by purging their cores from behind. This makes them very easy to get, especially if they're distracted by vacuuming up souls from their Hellraiser style boxes. 
What is fun about the combat are the dazzling moves. If you're easily distracted by shiny things like me, you'll enjoy dealing wind, fire and water damage to your enemies, then tying their cores up in a nice shiny bow. And look, even in hard mode, there are enough resources and snacks to keep your health bar up and your coffers full. You will have no issues here with resourcing. Outside of the combat, there are a variety of mini actions you take to absorb souls, which give you XP and money when you turn them into the magical telephone booths littered around Tokyo. Removing afflictions from souls can be fairly problematic due to controller issues here. So I'm playing on the PlayStation 5 and in theory, you're meant to replicate the move on the screen with a PlayStation touchpad or joystick. But often these don't register the moves, despite doing them multiple times. Sometimes you even have to start again. I think this should definitely be looked at for future updates because it feels like a game issue here. Ghostwire Tokyo's greatest strength is perhaps in the way it brings Tokyo to life or death. I was reminded of my visits to the city, wandering the streets filled with convenience stores, vending machines, bicycles, restaurants and shopping centres, alongside traditional shrines and parks. Exploring rooftops rewards gamers and reminds me very much of my time walking up and down steps of apartment buildings looking for photographic vantage points. Where this could have been improved was increasing the sinister nature of the city. While the abandoned city is haunting, the streets and interiors don't feel dark enough. Players are left with short snippets of surreal and intriguing design, especially when wandering the corridors of buildings. But where the game should push further into the horror aspects, it actually pulls away, and I found this with the gameplay as well. The only living beings left in Tokyo, apart from Akito, are cats and dogs. It's a small thing, but I can't state how much I did love the cat merchants in the convenience stores and markets. You can also feed dogs, but you can't feed the cats. And as a cat owner and animal lover, I felt kind of sad that I couldn't feed the cats when they were complaining about being hungry and abandoned. My only other beef with Ghostwire Tokyo is what's the point of having all these outfit changes when you're playing a first person game? The stores are bloated with music outfit and photo mode add-ons that are unnecessary. They might be enjoyable for some gamers, but I personally would have preferred a tighter, smaller game with more narrative depth in exchange for these extra items. While Ghostwire Tokyo grew on me as the story progressed, the relatively simplistic enemies in combat and the repetitive nature of side quests meant that I was left disappointed by what is a great concept. It's a fine game, but in 2022, fine doesn't cut it amongst the brilliant new releases available to gamers right now. I'm Kat Clay, and if you enjoyed this video game review, why not hit subscribe to support my channel. That's my take on Ghostwire Tokyo. Please stick around, I've got more game reviews and writing advice coming soon. And thanks so much for watching.